All right, people, time to learn a little proton NMR spectroscopy. I asked around my house who wanted to listen to the proton NMR video lecture. No one replied except for myopic turtle. Myopic turtle wants to learn some NMR, so here we go. When we're dealing with proton NMR spectroscopy, there are three main issues we need to contend with every time we're looking at a spectrum. Those three issues are chemical shift, integration, and spin-spin splitting. We are going to go through these individually, and at the end we will add them all together so we can properly analyze proton NMR spectra. The first thing is chemical shift. All right, the chemical shift in proton NMR is very similar to carbon-13, but the ranges are a little bit different. Recall carbon-13 went in general from 0 ppm to 200 ppm. Proton NMR goes from 0 ppm to about 10 ppm, maybe 12, 13 ppm or so. But 0 to 10 is the most common range. Recall when we did carbon-13 NMR, we had this little sheet here that gave us our ranges. Here is the sheet for proton NMR. And as we can see where the ranges are different, 0 to 200 versus 0 to 10 ppm, we do see some similarities. Look, if you have a hydrogen on a carbonyl carbon, it comes down at the far left side, the downfield end of the spectrum, just as carbonyl carbons come downfield in carbon-13. In proton, you have your aromatic protons coming in the middle, but to the left, a downfield from the middle a little bit, just like with carbon-13, downfield from the middle. A nice thing, however, about proton NMR versus carbon-13 NMR, you're in carbon-13, your aromatic region and your carbon-carbon double bond regions overlap each other. That's not the case with proton NMR. Your carbon-carbon double bond regions are separate from your aromatic regions. All right, and as we keep going down, note with carbon-13, uh, around here, around 70 ppm, we've got alcohols and ethers. Here we have our alcohols and our ethers in the proton NMR saturated alkanes further to the right. Another nice thing to note about proton NMR is the saturated alkane region really doesn't, does not overlap too much with the other regions. Carbon-13 saturated alkanes overlapped quite a bit. So you really could not tell a saturated alkene from a carbon bonded to a benzene ring or a carbon next to a carbonyl carbon. You do see those differences here. Saturated alkanes go from about 0.5 ppm to about 1.5, 1.7 ppm, maybe 2 ppm. Whereas a hydrogen bonded to a carbon bonded to an aromatic ring uh, really comes between 2 and 3 ppm. And the hydrogen on a carbon bonded to carbonyls also between 2 and 3 ppm. All right. Just like with carbon-13 NMR, there, we need to put in a reference for zero in our sample tubes, and we choose TMS, tetramethylsilane, as our zero reference. Recall tetramethylsilane for methyl groups in a silicon atom. That has 12 protons that are all equivalent to each other. They give one peak, and we say that peak exists at zero ppm. We set that. Now, on exams and whatnot, you will be given this sheet that we just saw that has the NMR ranges. However, it's a good idea to have some of these just in your head so you don't have to keep referring to that sheet all of the time. Let's look at some important values for chemical shifts. Uh, first, um, Note that if you have an aldehyde, as we saw before, if you have a hydrogen bonded to a carbonyl carbon, that gives a sharp peak a little above 10 ppm, a little bit downfield from 10 ppm. And it's a sharp peak. 
If you have a carboxylic acid, the hydrogen on the oxygen of the carboxylic acid also comes between 10 and 12 ppm. The difference is it's usually a very broad peak. Aldehyde peaks are very sharp. Carboxylic acid peaks very broad. All right, the next area of interest are aromatics. The hydrogen on the carbon of a benzene ring or an aromatic ring comes between 7 and 9 ppm. Almost always downfield from 7. A little tip. If you happen to see an aromatic peak, you a peak that you know is a uh, hydrogen on a aromatic ring and you notice that that peak is a little upfield from 7 ppm say 6.8 ppm 6.9 ppm that's a good indication that bonded to the benzene ring is an oxygen or a nitrogen what i found is when you have oxygens or nitrogens bonded to a benzene ring some of those proton peaks of the benzene ring come a little upfield from 7 ppm. Also recall, as we said just now, the carbon-carbon double bond, the hydrogen on a carbon that is double bonded to another carbon, comes between around 6 ppm, you know, 5 to 6.5 ppm or so, separate from the aromatic peaks. If you have a hydrogen bonded to carbon and that carbon is bonded to oxygen, we're talking about alcohols and ethers here mainly, then that peak comes between 3 and 4 ppm, usually closer to 4. They can be a little bit above 4, 4.1, 4.2, but usually around 4 ppm is where you'll find the hydrogens that are on a carbon bonded to an oxygen, whether it's an alcohol or the hydrogens on carbon bond to an oxygen of an ether. Note the terminology here. We are not looking at the hydrogen of the OH. We're not looking at the hydroxyl group hydrogen. We are looking at the hydrogens bonded to carbon and that carbon is bonded to oxygen. Those are the hydrogens that come at 4 ppm. We'll discuss this hydrogen that's actually bonded to the oxygen in a little bit. The next area where it's a good idea to just have in your head where the chemical shift lies will be hydrogens on carbon bonded to carbonyl and hydrogens on carbon bonded to an aromatic ring. They come between 2 to 3 ppm. Again, it's not a hydrogen bonded to an aromatic ring. Hydrogen bonded to an aromatic ring comes at 7 to 9 ppm. This is the hydrogen on a carbon and that carbon is bonded to the aromatic ring. Again here, this is a hydrogen on a carbon and that carbon is bonded to the carbonyl carbon. Question, what if the hydrogen was actually on the carbonyl carbon? What if there was a hydrogen on the other side of this carbonyl carbon? Where would it come? Right, that's an aldehyde. It would come around 10 ppm. All right, and that next thing to know, saturated alkanes, if you just have a CH3, CH2, CH2 chain, uh, those guys come between 0.5 and 2 ppm. Methyls at the end of the chain usually come around 0.9 ppm. Methylenes are CH2 groups. They usually come a little downfield of 1 ppm, 1.1, 1.2 ppm, which means not always, but often if you see a peak upfield from 1, like at 0.9 ppm, 0.8 ppm, it's probably a methyl at the end of a chain. And the last thing to note about these chemical shifts are hydrogens on oxygen, hydrogens on nitrogen, even sulfurs, hydrogens on heteroatoms, atoms other than carbon. Their chemical shift can kind of be anywhere. I've seen books that say, oh, it's between 0.5 ppm and 5 ppm. And then the next spectra you look at has it at 8 ppm. So I'm just going with the hydrogens on heteroatoms can be anywhere because it depends on many factors. Uh, the concentration of your reagents, the temperature, the if you've got water dissolved in there, if there's water dissolved in your sample, you did not dry it appropriately, then boy, you can get some crazy stuff with the OH peak of an alcohol. 
And the other thing, if the hydrogen is on heteroatoms, usually the peak is broad. Now, if it's fairly concentrated and you really dried it really well, it might not be that broad of a peak. What we tend to find is when you look at the spectra, the NMR spectra that are in textbooks, uh, the person did a really, really, really good job of getting a really, really nice and pristine sample that is very concentrated and no water in it. And so the peaks for OH and NH are not quite as broad. Let's face facts. When you're running an experiment and you get your sample, even after you recrystallized it, you don't make it so super, super pristine. When you run your spectra, you will find that the OH and NH peaks tend to be broader than they are in the textbook because, hey, you're not spending days getting the water out of these samples. All right, so let's look at our next page here. And let's go on to integration. So, good news, we've all had calculus. Even better news, if you have not had calculus, it doesn't matter. But in calculus, when we talk about integration, integrating a function, we're talking about the area under the peak. The function, such as a parabola, has a certain area under the peak. Integrating that area, integrating that function, excuse me, gives you the area under the peak. In NMR, the, all of our peaks are, you know, our functions, they are signals. All the signals are peaks. And so you can integrate them to get the area under the peak. The nice thing is, the area under the peak in NMR is proportional to the number of protons that cause the NMR signal. When we dealt with carbon-13 NMR, we didn't care about that because each individual carbon usually gave us one individual peak. Recall, occasionally with symmetry in the molecule, you would have peaks that are about twice as tall as the other peaks in the carbon-13, meaning two carbons cause that signal. But unless there's symmetry in the molecule, we know that each peak means one carbon. Proton NMR is different. When you have a methyl group, a CH3, all three hydrogen atoms are identical. So the peak that a methyl group gives, uh, gives one peak for all three of those hydrogen atoms. It only gives one resonance for those three hydrogens because they are identical. They're on the same carbon. Same thing with a CH2. Both of these protons are identical. We're going to adjust that later. But both these protons for now are identical, therefore they're only going to give one resonance. The thing is, with integration, if you have three protons of a methyl group, they only give one resonance. However, the area under that peak will integrate to three. CH2s only give one resonance, but since there's two hydrogens causing the signal, that will integrate to two. So integration is very important because you integrate the peak, that will tell you, oh, it integrates to three, that's probably a methyl group. This one integrates to two, that's probably a CH2 group. It helps us determine how many hydrogens are on each carbon. And that's all fine and dandy, but uh, there are problems. Problem number one. The instrument doesn't give you nice numbers like three or two. The instrument gives you numbers of area, and I don't even know what units they are using. And so it's the instrument will give you like 27.2 or 758 or 3,259 or something like that. It's just giving you a number, and each peak has a different number, but the deal is those peaks numbers have to represent nice small whole numbers like one, two, three usually. So even though it's just giving you an area, we can fairly nicely and fairly easily calculate what that integration value should be. Or at least it would be nice if it weren't for problem number two. These areas are off by a little bit. The area that it gives you is not exact. It's not precise. 
it's not going to give you 3.000 and 2.00. Uh, these uh, integration values can be off by a little bit. And it's not really the computer's fault. Uh, it's the way NMR works. It turns out the area under the peak can be affected by some of the things around it. And therefore, the area under the peak is not exactly proportional to the number of protons causing the signal. But it's close enough that we can, with a little bit of brain power, we can get a good idea of what it is. All right. Uh, for example of these problems that we're going to face, uh, let's look at this right here. If you have CH3, CH2, Cl, and I know you don't know them yet, the chemical shift values, but let's say this methyl group comes at 1.2 ppm, the CH2 comes at 3.2 ppm. We would expect two resonances in the proton NMR. We'd expect these three protons to give one signal, these two protons to give one signal. So we'd, we'd see something like this that at 3.2 ppm there are two protons so this should give an integral value of 2 and at 1.2 ppm that's where these methyl protons come in that should give us an integration of 3 and for those of you who have looked ahead we are ignoring spin spin splitting at this point we're going to get to that on the next video so this is what we would expect a nice thing the computer says oh two protons here three protons here but that's not what you're going to get that's not what the computer is going to print out for you what is a computer going to print out for you it will give you this at 3.2 it'll give you a number like 42 and at 1.2 it'll give you a number like 59. it also although probably not in red gives you these little s shapes these little swooshes here these swooshes also correspond to the integration. So you have two integration methods on this spectrum. You've got the numerical values, the 49, the 52, and you also have the height of these swooshes. The distance from the bottom of the swoosh to the top is also proportional to the number of protons causing the signal. So if you see this, 42 to 59, how do you get the proper integral values? How do you come up with the numbers of protons causing each signal? Well, there's a nice mathematical way to do it, and I do not recommend this because it tends to lead you down crazy rabbit holes. You can say, all right, um, let me divide the integral values by the smallest one. So my smallest one is 42. 42 divided by 42 is 1, yay. 59 divided by 42 is 1.4. So that would be a 1 to 1.4 ratio. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. And that's when people get lost in the numbers like that. I do this type of thing. I know these numbers can be off a little bit. So 59 is not a fun number, but 60, that's a fun number. I like 60. And 59 is awful dang close to 60. And so if this were 60, which it could be, that is good. And this is 42. What nice number is 42 close to? A 42 is awful close to 40. Which, according to my thinking, if this were 60 and this were 40, that, oh, 60 to 40, that's a nice 2 to 3 ratio. So that's the way I would do it. I would just say, okay, 59 is pretty close to 60, 42 is pretty close to 40. 60, 40, 3 to 2. Or if you want to do it the numbers way, you could say, okay, 59 divided by 42 is 1.4, which is also close to 1.5, which is 2 to 3 ratio. The other way to do it, and this is very old school, but you know, sometimes there's no school like the old school. This is the way I often do it because it works. I use these little swooshes. I say, okay. I'm going to put, uh, just get a piece of paper, line it up with the bottom line of the swoosh, and then just make a mark right here where the top of the swoosh is. So the paper's lined up from the bottom to the top of the smallest swoosh. And then I go over to here, and how many times does this fit in there? Oh, 
I can see that this peak is larger than from the bottom of the paper to that first mark, but two of them is too big. So, ooh, if I did cut this in half, I could say, okay, this is one, two, three. Ah, this peak was one, two. This peak is one, two, three. And there's my two to three ratio. Now, that is very old school using a piece of paper and kind of saying, well, it looks like it's this tall and here's about half of that. But I tell you what, my method, my old school method is quick and it gives you just as good, just as accurate an uh, integration as your numbers do. So you can do it any way you like. When we print out our NMR spectra on our and on our instrument, you get the numbers and you get the swooshes here. All right, but if you really want to be good, if you really want to do NMR properly, you normally will have a good idea of what your molecule looks like when you're running it. You run the NMR, you have an idea of what it looks like. You might say, oh, I have a methyl group bonded to an oxygen. Therefore, around 4 ppm, I'm expecting a peak that integrates to 3. And so when you get your spectra, you see, oh, there at 4 ppm, there's a nice peak. And you say, okay, that should integrate to 3. In the computer, you can just go in there and set the appropriate integration value. Just say, okay, that peak, I think it's a, my methyl peak bonded to the oxygen. That should integrate to three. I will set that integral value to three. And when you do that, when you set that integral, integral value to three, all of the other integrals in your spectra then go to their appropriate values, are pretty close to their appropriate values. For example, if I knew this should integrate to 3, and I went on the computer and said, okay, this 59, I'm going to make that into 3, then this number instead of 59 changes to 3, and the computer will change this one to like 2.1. It's like, oh, 3, 2.1, that's 3 to 2. All right, that's enough for integration. Now we're going to look, or in the next video, we're going to look at spin, spin, splitting. Because what we've looked at so far really isn't that much different than the carbon-13, except for the integration telling us the number of protons. But it's the spin, spin, splitting we're going to get into in the next video that really advances proton NMR beyond what carbon-13 can do.